Oh. Hello YouTube, Sentinel H here for episode 22 of my Rotorcraft tutorial series. Um, so I was thinking about what to talk about in this episode and it hit me, now that we've talked about wine springs, it would be the perfect time to go ahead and talk about the industrial coil. Um, you've seen me use the creative mode infinite energy version of the industrial coil in a lot of these episodes. So now let's take a look at how to craft the ones you can actually use and how they work. So, uh, in order to create industrial coils, you're going to need two items that we haven't talked about yet. The brake disc and the tension coil. Uh, the brake disc is crafted simply with a shaft bearing, a steel gear, two shaft units, and a 2x gear unit. So, hunk of steel, get you a brake disc. And the tension coil is crafted like this, with a shaft unit and then eight wine springs. Alright, so, this is a lot of steel, 8 times 4, 32, uh, and then 35 steel it'll cost you to build uh, the tension coil with the shaft unit. Because um, you need to use, well, it only uses one shaft unit, so it's technically 33. But you get three shaft units at once. Um, and then you just go in here and you just craft the tension coil with the brake disc with a shaft unit on top of a mount. And that gets you the standard industrial coil with a 720 MJ capacity. See? So, what do you do with the industrial coil? Well, it works similarly to what I've been... Um, what I've been doing with it. Let me grab my um, industrial coil, the creative version, So and a dynamometer. So if we come over here and I place down the creative coil just so I can get some power and put down my dynamometer and then place down this industrial coil. We'll do that in a second. So what the industrial coil does is it essentially acts as a power storage unit um, with a vari with a variable output. So if I place down the industrial coil, and then I place down a dynamometer, and of course I put a lever here, because you need a redstone signal um, to function these things. What the industrial coil does is you put power into it, it stores it like a giant wine spring, and then when you trigger its redstone signal, it will output that power in whatever denominations you select here. So on the uh, creative coil that I've been using, it just you can set it to whatever you want. On the industrial coils you craft, there is a maximum. So the standard coil has a maximum of 1024. So if I try and put 2048 radians per second in there, it'll automatically set it back to 1024. If I put 24, uh, 28, uh, 48 uh, newton meters of torque in there, it automatically sets it to 1024. So the basic industrial coil can only uh, output up to 1024 radians per second at 1024 newton meters, which is quite a bit. Um, you multiply those together, uh, quite a bit of power. Okay. So um, what can you do with the industrial coil? Well, the industrial coil not just it doesn't just store energy because you can break this, uh, pick it up, and it will keep the energy. Um, what it, like I said before, it, it can act like a capacitor. So what you can do is you can use lower strength uh, power and store it up over a long period of time in order to unleash it all in a uh, high-powered burst. So um, let me just check in here the handbook and we'll go and we'll grab the steam engine and that power output is 32 Newton meters at 512 radians per second. So if I set this to 512 radians per second and 32 Newton meters we are now outputting the power of a steam engine. And if we go into the industrial, and if we take our angular transducer and we hit the industrial coil, we can see that it is storing up energy. Very nicely. We're storing up kilojoules. And this does have a maximum of 720 megajoules. So, yeah, this thing can store a lot. Um, you can see that this steam engine's worth of output is charging it quite slowly. Um, it would take absolute ages to charge this up all the way to its maximum. Um, seeing how long it's taking just to get up to one megajoule, it'll hit that when this hits uh, 100,000. So um, we got some power in here. So we're inputting 16 kilowatts um, at 32 newton meters of torque and 512 radians per second. We've been doing that for a little while and we're just about to have a mega a megajoule stored up in this coil. There we got one megajoule out of 
720. So now, uh, if I go into the GUI, and we remember we have it set to 1024 radians per second and 1024 newton meters, significantly more output than what's going in. If I flip the lever, bam, we're outputting one megawatt, and it's just run out because we didn't have very much power stored, and it, you know, blasted through it really quickly. So if we hit it with a transducer now, we're back down to uh, zero joules. Let's make sure that's off, um, because that's another important thing about these coils, is that when they are turned on and outputting power, they will not be receiving power uh, from this end. So uh, the brake gets put on, and it, it will not receive power. Any power you put into it while, this is out, while the coil is outputting is just totally lost. So um, let's use a more realistic example of this thing. We're currently inputting the level of a steam engine. And if we come in here, maybe we want to output at the level of a gasoline engine, which wouldn't be you know, too ridiculous of an idea. 128 newton meters at 512. 128, oops. 128 newton meters at 512 radians per second. And we're storing up power. And now if we turn this on, we can see that we're currently outputting the output of a gas engine. And it's not going down nearly, I mean, it's going down really fast, but not nearly as fast as it did before. So you can see, if you put, uh, if you let this charge for long enough, um, then you could, you know, use this to get a uh, the output of a higher tier engine going. Or, you know, just, um, you know, output at whatever that strength you want. Um, so it's quite nice. As a capacitor, it works very well. You do have to be careful with industrial coils because they can explode. Um, <clears throat> when it says the maximum power, uh, maximum energy is 720 uh, megajoules, it is serious about maximum power. If you put more than that in these things, they explode quite violently, and we'll uh, demonstrate that at the end of the video. Um, just remember, this is what the industrial coil does. So it's quite useful. Now, this one has a limitation of... The, why does it keep getting dark? I have it set so it only has noon. Um, the, the, the regular coil has a maximum of 720. What if you want a bit more, a bit higher of a maximum? Well, you can go ahead and make yourself a higher tiered industrial coil, but it's to, that can store 240 terajoules. I mean, that, that is just... That is a ridiculous amount of power. I don't know how you charge that up to maximum. That is crazy power. Um, the way you could do, but in order to do that, you have to create a bedrock tension coil. Everything else is the same, but this thing is really expensive because it requires eight high-strength springs. And if you remember, each high-strength spring requires two diamonds and two bedrock dust. So in order to craft this thing, you're using 16 diamonds and 16 bedrock dust. So it's quite expensive to get. But once you get it, you end up with this industrial coil. And if we come over here, and we just replace this one. This one has a maximum output speed and torque of 4096, which is quite a bit higher. It's four times the, uh, well, it's four times the speed and torque, which I guess comes together to increase the maximum even more. But, um, yeah, that's quite a big upgrade. And you can see it has the same model as the uh, Creative Coil that I've been using. You can tell it's the upgraded one because it's got that diamond color in there. Um, so let's give it some power. And we'll just set this to some crazy high amount because it's going to take absolute ages to charge this thing up. We'll turn it on. Oops, better turn that off. Okay, so that's actually really close because I was putting in so much uh, energy um, by maxing that thing out ridiculously that we just about overloaded this thing already. So 240 terajoules is maximum and we just put 230 in there. So that was quite dangerous. I shouldn't have done that. Otherwise, I, I could have had a massive hole over here. Um, but as we can see, we can now set this to up to 4096 and 4096. And when we output, we can output 16 megawatts and it is going to drain but it's got so much power in it right now that see it's, it's not even going down it's not even registering that it's going down because we haven't dropped by one terajoule yet so i mean it, it would take an absolute age to fill this thing up but if you did you'd have all power f at 16 megawatts for a very long time and you can see it, it doesn't even appear to be going down there it goes it just ticked down by one terajoule so that's a lot of power a lot of power 
and you can out obviously output this and, and you can use it however you want. It's quite useful and if you wanted to you could output a lower amount and then it would last even longer. So that's the industrial coil, that's how it works. Just remember that if you have it outputting, it's not going to receive power. It's all that power going in is going to be wasted if you if a thing is running. Just just to show you that, now this thing is running. If I crank this on, you can see that this coil has not exploded because it's not taking in power. But if I turn this off, it would instantly explode because we're putting, you know, 99,999 9 gigawatts into it, which is ridiculous. But that's the industrial coils, that's how they work. It's not like the creative one. You put power in, then you can take the power out at whatever size of, at whatever speed and torque you want. All right, those are the, that's the industrial coils. They're quite useful. And I'll show you an application that you could use uh, for them uh, a bit later. Obviously, you've seen all the applications. Anywhere that you can use an engine, you could use an industrial coil that you've charged up. Now I'm gonna t we're going to talk about uh, two uh, additional uh, machines from the power transfer um, section of the handbook because we're almost done with the power transfer section. Um, it's only these things left to talk about and then uh, we're going to be done. So next episode we're going to talk about these things uh, and then we're going to be finished with the power transfer section which I think is a good thing to do. So first we're going to talk about the high ratio gear. Now people have been asking me in the comments uh, a couple, quite a few times, uh, well what kind of, what, how much gears would I need what, uh, to do this? How much gears would I need to do that? And a, a oftentimes um, especially when you're dealing with the hydrokinetic engines because of how much torque they have, the answer becomes you need a lot of gear ratio. You need a big gear ratio. And um, that ends up taking up a lot of space if, all, if you're using uh, gearboxes um, because you have to keep you know, stacking them in, in a train and that can take up a lot of space. So the high ratio gear is a way to get a, a really high gear ratio into one block. Unfortunately, it's really expensive. Well, I mean, of course it's going to be really expensive. Anyway, the high ratio gear is crafted like this, with a mount, two shaft bearings, four bedrock shaft units, and two 16x bedrock gear units. So this is a ton of bedrock uh, dust that you're going to have to be using, a ton of bedrock uh, gears to be making. Um, because remember, if, I, if we go through here, a bedrock gear is crafted with four bedrock dust, and you get eight of them. And you're going to need a lot more than eight of them to get two 16x gear units. So it's quite a lot of bedrock dust, um, but then once you've got that, you can get the high ratio gear. Why is it getting dark? It's supposed to be noon all the time. Anyway, maybe my brightness is set too low. I've got the high ratio gear set up over here just to show you what it can do. It does require lubricant, but it doesn't have a GUI. If we try and right click on it, uh, there's no GUI um, for the high ratio gear. Okay, but it does everything that a regular gearbox can do. It requires lu a lubricant, which is a bit odd for a bedrock one, but it's got a, it, it's got so many gears that you know that's why you lube. Uh, and you can obviously right click it, shift right click it with a screwdriver to change its its uh, output ratios. Anyway, let's turn on the power, and I'm giving it the power output of a hydrokinetic engine over there, and look how quickly it's chewing through lubricant. Okay. So it's currently filled, and it is just chewing through the lubricant. It's going very quickly. All right. I think I, I think this gear unit is probably the fastest lubricant consumer that I have seen uh, of the things that I've used that have used lubricant. Um, but as we can see, it is currently taking the um, 32. Wait, what's going on? That's odd. Um, oh, this is backwards. Ha! I had it in there backwards. There we go. Now we're up to 16,384 newton meters of torque, which is the same as a hydrokinetic engine. I had the uh, mounts backwards. Anyway, I, I, I broke my design over there. Um, so anyway, we've got the torque, we've got that, we've got that going in, and right now it's not doing anything. It's not doing anything because it's in a, a ratio that would reduce the speed to zero. So if we swap this into speed mode, you can see again how quickly it's using up the lubricant. But now it's taking this super high torque output of the uh, hydrokinetic engine, and it's uh, changing it into a um, 64 newton meters torque at eight. Uh, 
kiloradians per second. So it's taking 16,384 going down to 64 newton meters. Uh, what that is is a ratio of, I believe, 256 to 1, according to the handbook. Yeah, 256 to 1 gear ratio uh, in this in, uh, in this uh, high ratio of gear. Um, just keep in mind, it does require a lot of lubricant. But it's a way that you can get a super high ratio uh, in a one block space. Now, if it runs out of lubricant, it is still made out of bedrock. So it's not going to break. But once it runs out of lubricant, it just won't do anything. I'm just going to break this one and place down one that has no lubricant. It doesn't break, but it doesn't work either. you got to supply this with lubricant. Um, so anyway, that's the high ratio gearbox. Quite useful if you want to get a really ridiculously high ratio very uh, in, in a short number of blocks. But remember, it's going to take a lot of bedrock. So now let's talk about this uh, puppy right here, the multi-directional clutch. The multi-directional clutch is crafted with four shaft units, a two XU unit, two redstone dust, and two base panels. And what the multi-directional clutch is, is, well, it's exactly what it says, the multi-directional clutch. Um, but what does that mean? What that means is that it takes in power, and let's rotate this into the power source. It takes in power from one side, and it's able to output it from any of its other sides and is controlled by a redstone signal. Now, it might look like all the sides are turning, but if we put the dyno down, it's not actually outputting any power from any of these sides. Um, by default, the multi-directional clutch's power output is on the bottom side, you see? Down there. Okay. Um, now, if we right-click on it, we can see this GUI. Now, this might look confusing and uh, at first but it's, it's really not that difficult it's not that complicated what this is what this is is a, the ability to set a side of it of the output um, based on the strength of a redstone signal so as we all know now redstone has a str signal strength ranging from zero which is off to up to 15 which is when uh, the, the lever or something is right next to the block and then as the redstone gets further away it loses its signal strength the multi-directional clutch allows you to assign a side to each one of those so i just changed one to the blue side the yellow side the black side the orange side the magenta side you know which is what we've been using all along like remember the bevel gears the bevel gears of course they also have this color because it's what this is is a redstone enabled bevel gear Okay, so if, if I grab a lever and I place a lever right next to this, currently the uh, bottom side, which is the cyan side, is active because we have no redstone signal. Now, if I choose, if I turn the um, the um, 15 or any of these really to something else like the blue side, when I come on, when I turn this on, now if we hit it with the a transducer. Um, okay, it's still going down. I, oh, it's not receiving the power from the uh, lever because it's a block too low. So let's place that there. We'll flip it. And now it's still not doing it. Do we have to put this lever directly on top of it? Okay. Come on. Oh, is that, is that not producing a signal strength of 15? Let's go ahead and go here. Nope, that's not working either. We'll set that to blue. That's not working either. Why is it not working? Am I doing something incorrectly? Is there a side? Oh wait, maybe I have to use redstone dust. It's a good experiment, because now you all know how this works. I probably have to use redstone dust. Nope, that's not going to connect. Okay, there we go. So you do need to use redstone dust because you need to be able to stick the power straight into there. Maybe you don't. Maybe I'm just doing it wrong, but I, I you know, redstone dust will work. Maybe I can put a block here and put a lever there, but oops, but it didn't seem to be working when I did that. So use the redstone dust, and I'm totally failing it up, but you guys are used to my fails. And we set that to the blue side, and now we can see that it's not working. Oh, um, because that's one, and it's getting a signal strength of more than one. Um, the signal strength here is, is signal 14, so if we set the blue side to 14, now all of a sudden it's going up. But if we were to set 15 to or yellow, uh, it's going to do this. So you have to match the um, signal strength exactly uh, in order for this thing to work. So um, remember, remember that. It doesn't. 
and, and that's a good thing because that means that you can set it to all these different values and then you just you can just drag a, a redstone out here if I turn this off and I turn that on way down there now the signal strength down here is at 10 if I go to 10 and I set this to the black side now we're outputting to the black side which we couldn't do because our redstone is there but you get the point you can use redstone signal to switch the power output uh, to one of the other sides okay now what can we do with this multi-directional clutch? Now, you've probably already thought of some uses for it. Um, one use that we can use for this uh, that, uh, that works in tandem with our industrial coils is say we have an industrial coil, right, that we want to charge up. But remember that when we're outputting power from the coil, any power that goes in is being wasted. So maybe we want to have uh, two coils or just some other sort of... Uh, power using thing. So let me go ahead and we'll just place a coil here and we'll place a coil here. You can see that right now we're not outputting power in the right, in the right direction. But this is the magenta side. So let us set uh, 10 to the magenta side. And then if we turn that off. We can, well, it doesn't really matter. We'll, we'll just use the 14. We'll set that back to whatever. 14 can be the magenta side and then off can be the orange side. Okay, this is just one example of how you can do this. So currently, power is going into this industrial coil. But let's say we got this coil to, you know, the amount of power that we wanted it to be at, and, you know, we want to start outputting. Well, now I'm outputting. Whoop, that, that messed that up. We want to start outputting. So now we would be outputting power um, over here. Let me grab a dynamometer. If we had set this to a value. So let's just do, I don't know, 32 radians per second, 128 newton meters. And now we're outputting power out of our industrial coil. But since we're still trying to put power in, this power is being wasted. Well, what if we now flip this lever? Now the power output is going over here. So we're now charging a second coil while we're discharging this coil and no power is being wasted. So that's one of the uses that you could use this multi-directional clutch for. Just remember, it's basically a redstone control bevel gear. So if you're uh, using uh, bevel gears and swapping between the different sides to send power to different machines when you need it, the uh, multi-directional clutch could allow you to do that with the flick of a lever, or, you know, it could allow you to do that some other way. There are some, uh, there are certain things that will output a redstone signal, and you can use that uh, with your, um, and automate this sort of thing. So anyway, that's the multi-directional clutch. So as you can see, there's a lot of power transfer options in uh, Rotary Craft, and a lot of things that are, um, redstone compatible and um, I'm hoping that this video has not confused you but enlightened you as to the use of these um, various machines industrial coils this super high ratio gear and then this multi-directional clutch which you know again this in this seems intimidating at first but this this UI is this GUI is really not intimidating just remember that all it's doing is talking about redstone signal strength so yeah that's that's that so next episode we are going to talk about the shaft power bus and uh, that's going to need its own video because it's you know it's, it's quite a complex multi-block thing but uh, it's basically like the ultimate in um auto in, in power uh direction but um so yeah we're going to finish up the power transfer section and then we're going to move on to another section so let me know what section you want to see if you want to start seeing the uh offensive and defensive weapons let me know we can start doing those um, otherwise, I'll keep going down the book uh, table of contents. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm Seth Leitch, and I'm signing out.